Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. <laughs> there I am. Well, good morning to you all. Um, welcome to St. Luke's. Um, you are here on the fifth Sunday in Epiphany. You'll be happy to know that we had a wonderful vestry uh, retreat this past Friday and Saturday. And your vestry and I are excited about everything going on here at St. Luke's. And we're grateful for your participation in the various offerings that we're, we're, we're giving, not just Sunday, but throughout the, the week. And um, it's hard to believe, you know, that the Epiphany season is almost over. It seems like we just, we just had Christmas, and yet we're, we're just weeks away from Ash Wednesday. And another uh, sort of Lenten um, series and a preparation and brings a season all, all together different than Epiphany. And so we're, we're almost there, but not yet. Not yet. So we have a couple more weeks to reflect upon what the Epiphany season has given us to consider. Namely, what is the revelation of God in Christ for the world? That's what we have been looking at um, during this season. As you can imagine, uh, over the past couple of weeks, I've been thinking a lot about this concept and how it relates to our, our current cultural moment here. You know, even when I took my ordination vows, I was charged to preach the gospel afresh in every generation, not anew, but afresh. And so that means that we need to be aware of what is going on around us, not simply here in St. Luke's in the Hilton Head environment, but around the world for the sort of global Christian witness. What's going on around here? What does this revelation of Jesus to the world mean um, for the sake of our 21st century lives? As I preached about last week, this will require a little bit of effort on our part to, as it were, know what we believe and why. Because we are charged with going out into the world to defend the hope that has been put in our hearts by the Holy Spirit in Christ our Lord. This is what we've been asked to. How can you, how can you have hope in the midst of this news cycle? How, what do you mean you're not afraid of dying? How can you go to this funeral? What do you mean that you have joy in the midst of that diagnosis? How can you? Well, let me explain. Let me witness. Let me testify to what the Lord has done for me. Sing hallelujah. So that's our task here, and I was talking about this with the vestry yesterday uh, during our sort of day-long retreat, and we were reflecting on our, our vision statement here, which you may know is very short and comprehensive, to know Christ and to make Him known. That's what we do. We grow in our knowledge of Him, and as we grow in that knowledge, we then go out into the world to make that knowledge known, loving God and our neighbors as ourselves. As we know Him better, we grow in our confidence to speak about Him rightly, sing about Him, and as we said, preach to our neighbors with confidence and joy. And this is something that I have the great joy and privilege of watching actually take place. You know, I watch people, sort of emaciated sheep, being fed by word and sacrament, but get stronger and louder and more confident, and courage begets courage. And to see people, watch people deepen in their peace of the Lord is an amazing thing to behold. Watching people get excited about reading the Bible, to get excited about reading theology books, you know, with very few pictures, you know, things like this. Um, people simply finding the joy of the Lord. Well, it was the participation in this that actually drew me into the ministry when I was in college some, some 25 years ago now, it seems. Well, not seems, it is. And that was, a, that's right, it seems, that's a long time. Um, but I was, um, I was drawn into the ministry in part because I had not only experienced this deepening sense of peace myself, but had the joy of helping communicate that and, and watch it spread to others. And it hasn't abated. And I'm grateful for that. It's a wonderful gift. And I thank the Lord every day um, for the privilege and the opportunity to be a shepherd among His sheep. But along the way, in these 25 years, I've had my understanding of God both challenged. I've had my, my reading and interpretation of the Scripture has changed over, over the, these many years. And I look back at some of my early teachings and sermons with sort of mild horror at times, <laughs> because not that they were heretical by any means. I mean, I'm grateful for that but that there was some necessary and worthwhile sort of training that I did not have at certain points in my life 
to be able to, as the Apostle Paul tells Timothy, rightly handle the word of truth. Because you can read your Bible all you want, and you can still not understand a word it says. And that is a great tragedy that is not perpetuated simply on young, ignorant, would-be preachers, but throughout the church, down through history. Because for some years, I did not handle, rightly handle the word of truth, or divide the word of truth, as King James put it, not out of malice, but ignorance. And I'd like to think that this ignorance was easily addressed and removed, but it's not. It seems very persistent because I see it perpetuated from pulpits all around the world down to today. And then by extension, well-intended Christians who are being misled and misguided and misinformed in one crucial area of biblical interpretation, namely the difference between the law and the gospel or we should say the distinction between the law and the gospel. The just and holy demands of God on one hand, and on the other, the good news of what he has done to save. They're related, to be sure. They're in distinction to each other, but they are not the same thing. And when we, mit- when we confuse the two, well, then we risk losing the joy of our salvation. It's no small thing. But I take this on good authority. You know, for those of you taking my Galatians class, uh, some of this will start a, sound a little familiar, because with the, gospel, with the apostle as my guide, confusion over this point is so crucial, what he saw being perpetuated in the Galatian church, he said it was so crucial that the very gospel itself was at stake. So I take it on good authority to help clarify and distinguish this all-important relationship. And we see how easily this confusion persists when we read today or we hear Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, his famous Sermon on the Mount, because how you understand this sermon will illustrate whether or not you know the difference between the law and the gospel, and therefore the Bible itself. Now, that's a heavy claim, I know, but I'm going to back it up, and I've spent a lot of time considering this, and in fact, when this distinction was made clear in my life, the Bible was open and my life was forever changed. And I say that with with deep emotion, because um, I wouldn't be a preacher if I didn't know this. So, first of all, the law. Let's look at that in service of this. Shortly before our reading from 2 Kings that we heard read beautifully today, thank you with the difficult names, uh, we heard today uh, read, we hear this. Well, Josiah was the third in line of Manasseh, his grandfather, and then Amon was two wicked and vile kings who set up Asherah poles, idolatrous things in the temple, who did not obey or follow the ways of the Lord and were, were faithless and, um, and uh, tragic rulers. The leaders that Josiah, that preceded Josiah from the top down were immoral and faithless. They were supposed to promote justice, truth, and faithfulness, but instead they actively discouraged people from worshiping the true God. So this is what young Josiah, after his father had been killed, was elevated to the throne at age 8 in 648. But it wasn't until 18 years later when he began to rebuild the temple that the book of the law was rediscovered, as we heard read today. And when that book was read to Josiah, well, everything, as we heard, changed. And Shapen the scribe showed the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest had delivered me a book. And Shapen read it before the king, and it came to pass, when the king had heard the words of the book of the law, he rent his clothes. He fell down to his knees. You see, being brought up in a royal court that had been apostate, For 57 years, Josiah was unaware of the Lord's explicit demands until it was made clear to him, until it was read out before him, and his reaction to this reading of the book of the law is very instructive. He was terrified. He was shaken. He rent his clothes and sought to amend his ways. In other words, he was convicted. You see, this is the work of the law, to bring us up short to expose our idolatry, to judge and accuse us, not wrongly, but rightly, of the things that we have done and left undone. This is the work of the law, to bring the righteous accusation to your sinful heart 
and like Josiah, bring you to your knees. You see, perhaps like him, many of us were ignorant of the specific demands of the law. Perhaps you were brought up in a family uh, or have had multiple generations of people who rejected God and followed the devices and desires of their own hearts as we pray. And maybe you're here because like Josiah, something happened along the way upon hearing the explicit demand of God through the law and then everything changed. You see, this is how people become Christians because everyone is suffering under the weight of the law, having it written on our hearts and all. (laughs) However much they know of it or don't know of it, people find themselves accused by the righteous, holy law of God. People run from this accusation. People try to silence this accusation, but that does not work. The only answer to the accusation of the law, because it is in fact true, is to be absolved, to be forgiven, to be restored. That's the work of the law. People run from it. People set up uh, um, sort of uh, edifices to protect themselves from the accusation. People sever the relationships that are bringing up that judgment. People do anything they can until they find themselves on their knees in search of a Savior, and they find their Lord, Jesus Christ, crucified for them. You see, this is what we heard in the book of Galatians, for those of you who are studying through it with us. Go back and read it for yourself in chapter 3. The whole point of the law. Why then the law, says Paul? To increase the trespass, to bring to light what is actually wrong with you so that the Lord in His mercy can heal and save. That's the point of the law, to expose sin and to bring us to our knees. And I don't like it any more than you do. I promise you. I wish the law were sort of a, like an illustrated little guide that I could follow to avoid pain and punishment. I wish that it was sort of like a benign instruction manual that really, you know, if I really buckled down, that maybe I could, I could navigate through this world without having my actual sin exposed. But that's not what the law is. The law convicts, exposes, and reveals Now, to be sure, there are ways that God instructs and guides us by His Spirit to help us grow and mature as Christian people. We're very grateful for that, and we talk a lot about that, but that's not the law. That's not the work of the law. The work of the law is to accuse, convict, expose, and remove every avenue for hope and salvation in your life other than Jesus. That's the point. At the time of the Reformation, this was the, the sort of one, of one of the crucial insights that had been given back to the Reformers by the study of Scripture. They had a Latin phrase, which you'll like to learn and pass around at your various parties, um, called lex semper accusat, the law always accuses. See, the law always accuses because it, in its holy righteous decree, will always find purchase in the sinful heart of a man or a woman. This is why it always accuses. Now, you may be sitting here thinking, well, this is a nice um, academic point, a fine theological distinction. Thank you for the Latin, but this has very little contemporary relevance to my life. You may be thinking that, and you would be wrong (laughs) if you you were, because I would submit to you, and listen, I have done nothing my entire life except deal with people in various states of belief and unbelief with respect to the gospel. I have never seen a point, or I'll put it this way, of all the points of theological confusion I've ever encountered in my life as a minister, and I do not say this lightly, of all the points where people have, don't really understand how to um, sort of theologically something, right? Of all the points, both personally and professionally, there's not one that is more practically relevant to people's, to people's everyday lives. You know, people have some confusion about the Trinity we can talk about. People have some confusion about how the Old and the New Testaments are related. People have confusion. That can be worked out, but that doesn't nail, I mean, that doesn't um, get to the heart of where your relationship with both God and neighbor is most uh, uh, acutely felt. What do I mean by that? Well, as you probably know, people don't like to be judged. (laughs) You may have run into that in your life, Um, and that's true. We don't like to be judged. But what happens when the judgment is just? 
in a relationship. When you have a relationship with someone and you learn something about them that you do not like and wish you hadn't known and you have, in fact, is something that should be judged, what do you do? What does someone do when they find that about you? Well, you, what, what do you do when you have the law of God written on your heart, as it were, when it exposes the, your sin and the sin of someone you love? Well, if you don't know the gospel, then your only recourse is to try and ignore it. You try to explain it away. It's not your fault. You didn't know any better. Um, you know, it was really her fault. It's really his fault. It really wasn't. And you try to explain this away, and you try to hide it, and if you've ever been in a relationship like that, well, you're probably not in it any longer because there's no possible way to break through if all you are basing your relationship on is the law. Because when you come up against the right and accurate judgment of God himself in your heart, in the context of another person, well then, without forgiveness, there is no way forward. And so you see what happens is if our primary understanding and relationship with God is not in the gospel but in the law, well, then the very same relational breakdown occurs. And we begin to try. I'm trying to do what you ask me. I'm hoping that you will, you will save me from pain and punishment. And the longer we walk in the law, the more loudly the accusation grows of the things done and left undone. And finally, we sever that relationship with God and then begin to sever our relationships with each other. Now, to be sure, you may still be in it, but it has nothing of the joy of being known and knowing someone in the actual love of God, which is his mercy for sinners. You see, you cannot have a reconciled life with neighbor if you do not have a reconciled life with God. This is where an understanding of the law comes in rightly. Because if we understand how the law works, if we can describe it, it doesn't mean that it doesn't still affect us. <laughs> and it's how our stone hearts are pulverized and made flesh. It's how our consciences are tenderized. Because when we have found the law to have brought us to our knees and at that moment see in Jesus our redeeming and forgiving Savior, well, then that's the love for others that mirrors God's very love for sinners, for the ungodly. Because we have been exposed as just those people to whom God has shown mercy. You see, this is what Jesus knew. He said very much to Simon the Pharisee, he says, Simon, he who's been forgiven much loves much, and we know our need for forgiveness by being brought up short by the holy love law of God. Notice in our service, when we have the law read, you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. And our response is, Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy, which is the Christian response to the holy, righteous law of God. So I've said, we've seen how the law accuses, accuses us, kills our pretensions, and exposes sin. But we're not going to stay there. We're going to go now to the gospel, which brings us to the Sermon on the Mount. Last week, we heard the Beatitudes, the list of blessings that Jesus knew would be the hallmark of those who would come to faith in him. Remember, Jesus in this famous sermon is sort of preaching to his disciples and to the gathered crowds, and he begins with the great blessings. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who, who suffer, uh, search for righteousness. Blessed are you when you persecute you. So he begins to, he grounds his teaching in this blessings that he knew would come upon the gift of his own life for them. By the power of the Spirit, the church, despite all of the suffering and persecution, would be those blessed people who would come to know God rightly through the death and resurrection of his Son. So we have the Beatitudes. He immediately goes into a discussion about the type people that they would then be, these blessed people. He says that they would be salt of the earth and light of the world. Salt and light. Two things that then, like now, have very specific uses and ramifications. 
Salt is used to flavor and preserve, and light is used to dispel darkness. Taken together, that means that Christian people are to influence the world by bringing to bear the reality of God through their lives, which will be in contrast to the world. That's what being salt and light to the world means. And where is that contrast most visible, you may wonder? Well, in their understanding of the law, but not as those who have followed it perfectly, but instead those who have been convicted by it and brought to the throne of mercy at the feet of Jesus. That's one of the points, if not the most prominent point of contention with the world, where the salt and light is most acutely seen. Think about it. Think about this. The conflicts we see around the world regarding Christian witness With few exceptions, it's not that Christians are running around um, saying that we're more righteous than everyone else in the world, that we're running around and and complaining that, that, that you all need to be more holy like we are, or that better. We're not claiming to be wiser, more just, or more caring, but simply forgiven. We have the audacity to say that we have been forgiven by God through His Son, and you need to be too. That's the work of the law in the hearts of a believer. This is the word of the cross we heard preached about last week. It's foolishness to some, a stumbling block to others, but for us who are being saved, the very crucified Lord is our hope because it was supposed to be us on that cross, and yet He took it on our behalf. The law has done its work in my heart, and the gospel has raised me to the new life of faith. You see, people can accept the idea of a God, perhaps, or the divine, or the spiritual, but they run from the accusation of the law as far as they can go. They drive it out as much as they can, but it's a fool's errand. Jesus knew this. He said explicitly, I didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Because the law demands, as we will hear further on in Matthew, that be ye perfect, therefore, as your holy heavenly Father is perfect. The law is summed up in the command to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And as we said, our response is not, let's get to it, but Lord, have mercy. And Christians see in Christ that very thing. You see, because of this, we'll see more explicitly next week in the subsequent sections of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus just ratchets up the demands. He takes what you've heard about the law, and he makes them more challenging, more rigorous, more impossible. Because when we hear the law, the question should be the very ones that was on the lips of the disciples. You remember when the rich young ruler came. Dear teacher, rabbi, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Follow the commands. I have followed these since I was a youth. Yes, but sell everything your own and give to the poor and follow me. And the man went away saddened, right? Well, what was his disciples' reaction? Well, who then can be saved? Indeed, that is the question. And the answer is nobody but those whom God has forgiven through the blood of His Son. So what are we going to say about all this? What what are we to say to these things? What difference does this make in your life? Well, as I said before, I would submit to you that if you don't understand this distinction, and we'll continue to work on it as long as you allow me to, I said before, if you don't understand it, you will misunderstand the Bible. If you misunderstand the Bible, you're not going to know God rightly, and if you don't know God rightly, then no matter how much church you come to, you will lose the joy of your salvation. The joy that comes very conversely to the world through being accurately and wholly diagnosed as a sinner. There's joy in that because we know where we can go and what we can hear to be forgiven, to be restored, to be redeemed, and to be put back into the life of faith in the God who shows mercy. You see, practically speaking, this looks like a group of people, a church, a household of God, who are being brought back week after week to the sometimes stark and painful reality of who they are outside of Christ, namely sinners, and who they are in Christ by faith, His beloved, His adopted children. And over time, 
Over time, this produces a family. This reunites husbands and wives. This reconciles parents and children. This restores the years that the locusts have eaten, says Isaiah, because it creates a people who are known for mercy, known to be long-suffering with sinners, known for forgiveness. In other words, they're the salt of the earth, used for seasoning and provision. They're the light of the world, reflecting, as it were, the light of Jesus and his saving love for sinners. And they're the ones who hold up the law of God as that demand, that holy standard that Jesus fulfilled on our account and trust that they are, in fact, his beloved sons and daughters. Thanks be to God. Amen.